Tracy for moderating it. Probably 10 other people, but since this is not the Academy Awards, I won't do that. <laughs> uh, I do want to say thanks to Pickwick uh, Books. If anybody wants to buy the book, Pickwick has it. And the editor shop on um, Upper Broadway <clears throat> has signed copies. So my book is a cultural history of the Miss America pageant spanning beauty, race, pop culture, ed women's education, uh, national identity uh, over the past hundred years that it's existed. It's just coming up on its hundredth birthday. And I interviewed eight Miss Americas and a bunch of state and, and local winners for it uh, to try to understand its workings and its institutional history uh, and also just to double check my own preconceptions about it, some of which stand and some of which have been changed during the course of my research. So I'm gonna do a slide presentation. And so let me share. And Tracy, just holler if for any reason you're not seeing what you should be seeing. So for people of a certain age, of which I'm one, um, Miss America was a TV staple when, when we were growing up, but many younger people don't even know it still exists. You might ask why it warrants examination now. One uh, answer is that we're in the midst of a deeply painful national reckoning about what it means uh, to be an American. And uh, for the past century, the pageant has attempted to define that by crowning what it deems an ideal American woman. It's a project that's always been incredibly fraught, both because of Miss America's best intentions and its most egregious omissions. So when I began, uh, uh oh, no, I cannot advance. Here we go. When I began researching the topic, um, this was my impression of Miss America. I stumbled on it in about 2015, and I was astonished to discover that it not only that it still existed, but that, that it still existed in this form, that women were, you know, parading around in swimsuits on stage. And so I was just really curious to know who, who does it, who watches, why do they watch, how long has it existed? And uh, it all began here in 1921 with just eight women who competed at a, it was part of a fall festival, it wasn't a standalone thing then that was designed to extend the summer tourist season into, into the fall in Atlantic City. And the first winner is third from right, Margaret Gorman from Washington, D.C., who had just turned 16 weeks before. The first pageant was held on the Steel Pier in Atlantic City in a ballroom. And it started at a time when Atlantic City was a really thriving, growing resort town because it was newly accessible by train. In its uh, early days, the symbolism was all about the sea. Gorman was a mermaid queen crowned by a figure called King Neptune, um, who was a man who, uh, well, there were various King Neptunes, but the first King Neptune was the inventor of smokeless gunpowder and you'll never see him You'll never see his left hand because he lost it in an explosion during an experiment. So she was uh, not on the, you know, the, the symbolism and the imagery was, was, was mermaid based and she received a mermaid uh, trophy of a, of a lounging mermaid on a platform. Um, but she did wear this Lady Liberty crown that you know, implied patriotic symbolism it quickly evolved into a jeweled crown, which is one of the contradictions of Miss America. The fact that for most of its life, Miss America has been crowned with a jeweled crown, um, symbolizing something that is, you know, inherently antithetical to democracy and to <laughs> the founding of our nation. Um, so Gorman is shown here wearing um, what was considered a very, very scandalous swimsuit at the time. In the previous decade, the, the swimsuit fashion was changing at this time. In uh, the previous decade, women had been liberate, liberated from wearing um, woolen dresses to swim, like basically streetwear, sometimes with corsets that completely hid the body. And now 
as um, the, the, the decade got rolling, more women were playing sports, they were freer to wear something they could move more easily in. And the pageant capitalized on this for all the wrong reasons, asking women to show their bodies in an exercise that had nothing whatsoever to do with sports or swimming. And uh, to counter that, the sexiness of it, their wholesomeness and marriageability was underscored and rewarded. Even today, amazingly, Miss America contestants must be single and child, childless. And at the time, it was actually illegal to wear what they wore. Uh, it's the knees. The knees are the problem here, her exposed knees. Um, normally, women had to wear their stockings rolled up over the knees to, to cover them. And though the, the laws varied nationally in Atlantic City at this time, it was illegal to wear what she's wearing, but the law was suspended for the day of the pageant. The consequences when it was in effect could be quite serious. Women were arrested on the beach for um, you know, showing their knees, showing bare skin. Uh, this is a woman in Chicago being arrested. The beach cops actually went around and measured the amount of exposed skin between the skirt and the knee to determine if the bathing costume was acceptable. Just a few days before the pageant, a woman in Atlantic City, she was from LA actually, rolled up her, uh, refused to roll up her stockings on a searingly hot day and was arrested, spent time in jail. Um, and she, this is an image of her, she wore her stockings rolled down in jail in protest of this law. But it wasn't just changing fashion that inspired the pageant or that made it possible. Women had just won the vote or more specifically white women at, at that point had won the vote. And the suffragists had used pageantry as dramatic tools in their marches and their activism, which the pageant borrowed from. <clears throat> this 1913 photo shows a tableau in which Columbia is summoning justice, charity, liberty, peace, and hope at the first suffrage parade in Washington, DC. And the pageant also appropriated sashes like what the suffragists wore, highly symbolic of women's collective political identity and power. But Miss America, of course, used them to denote individual identity and, um, and regional identity and pitted them against each other. So the sashes didn't indicate a you know, communal cause. And also used them to confirm a vision of womanhood that was all about appearance and not about um, forward movement and participation in the male realm. Uh, this is from that same march, a suffragist from that parade. The pageant also expressed anxiety about women's, um, uh, about, well, it expressed anxiety about women's liberation and progress, but also about immigration, which in, uh, informed the, you know, the, the, the anxiety was sort of fueled and informed by the growing eugenics movement. 20 million immigrants had landed on American shores around the turn of the century. And the pageant channeled concern about the changing makeup of our country by reaffirming what they deemed it meant to be an, an American woman, a young white virginal girl next door. <clears throat> Not her, she's the, she's the suffragist. Uh, this is a photo of Norma Smallwood, who was crowned a few years after Gorman. In the early years, the contestants were introduced with recitations of their actual genealogical history and breeding, like the word breeding was actually used, tracing their pedigree back for generations. And so interestingly, Native American women were excluded, but invited, oddly, as quote, honored guests in their own country, I might add. Here on the right, you see 19-year-old Jessie Jim, who had been crowned um, Princess America II at the National Indian Congress uh, beauty competition in Washington state. But there's a double irony here, which is that the Miss America being crowned, Norma Smallwood, it was revealed much later, was part Cherokee. But she had not indicated that when, when she competed. I mean, she probably knew that it would, disqualify her or disadvantage of her. But finding these compliant women who both wanted to win the contest and remain queens of domesticity was 
not always easy. A number of the early contestants, and there's some of the really most interesting ones, broke the rules and they make for some fascinating characters. This is Helmar Liederman, Miss Alaska, wearing her white swimsuit, white stockings, her jazzy white tam. And she was exposed as a married New Yorker who had immigrated from Sweden a year earlier and had spent exactly three days in Alaska, though she presented herself as Miss Alaska. She was known as the Arctic Venus. She was very popular, people, people loved her. And she and her husband had posed as a brother sister team at other beauty contests. When her background was exposed, she was disqualified. And she responded by filing a $150,000 lawsuit in which she wrote these priceless words. My worth in future beauty contests was reduced tremendously thereby. To the American public, there is no romance, no zest, no mystery to the married woman. She is as flat as a blown out tire, as tame as a dish of rice and milk. She's like a story read several times, all discovered and finished. Lederman had stated exactly why married women were forbidden from competing in this contest in the first place. Uh, what was her line? Blown out tire, tame as a dish of rice and milk. So she was one of many renegade contestants who tested the rules, but the biggest one of all was also the only one to quit the pageant the night she won. This was Betty Cooper, Miss New Jersey. Well, actually she was Miss uh, Bertrand Island because back then it wasn't, it was, they, they were, uh, they represented regional identities that were often quite local. And so the night she won, um, she took off in the middle of the night. She'd been pushed into competing by friends. She sort of wanted to win, but she didn't really want to win. When she got to Atlantic City, she saw that the whole thing was kind of tacky, uh, complicated by the fact she fell in love with her pageant appointed chauffeur and escaped with him in a motorboat, his motorboat, late at night after her crowning and went home. She said she just wanted to finish high school um, she did some, uh, actually, and she also didn't want to have to leave her, her high school friends and basically go out on the road and start a vaudeville career at what well, I think she was like 17. And so she did do some Miss America events. She did represent Miss America for a year or two, but then quit. And I mean, forever, when a reporter called her in 2000, she only died a few years ago, uh, asking for an interview, she said, there is no Miss America here. So that was it for her. As a result of things like this, a new director who came in in the 30s, Lenora, Lenora Slaughter, who's shown here, tried to bring, to bring the contestants to heel and to bring in classier winners um, like Cooper, who came from a quote, respectable family in New Jersey. Slaughter made it basically what it is today. In the 30s um, and 40s, she added a talent section formal entry requirements, a coronation ceremony with evening gowns instead of bathing suits. She was, you know, that was all part of her trying to upclass it. And most significantly, the scholarship program that endures as the pageant's um, greatest point of pride today. One thing she really did not like about it was the um, formation photos that were a staple of it throughout the 20s and 30s although they did continue. She knew that people liked this, um, but she believed that they were um, objectionable because they pre presented the women as, as horse flesh, as she put it. But she also knew it was a, a defining central piece of pageant. Slaughter also pumped up the patriotism of the institution, which again made for a very contradictory symbolism when you think about the fact that you couldn't pick a, a symbol um, that's less representative of America than a crown, especially now that Meghan Markle just torched the British monarchy. But of course, the pageant didn't represent our nation. Um, actually, I'm ahead of myself here, <clears throat> so I'll go back. Black women were excluded unofficially, and then uh, formally through the notorious rule number seven, which was on the books in the 40s, from the 40s to the early 50s. And this said that contestants must be, quote, in good health and of the white race. A few Asian and Latina women competed, 
but no black women for the first 50 years of the pageant were included. Incidentally, strangely enough, Canadians competed in Miss America until the 1960s, unbelievably. Um, Slaughter defended this rule by saying that uh, the pageant officials simply couldn't judge black beauty or black women fairly, which was tantamount to saying they couldn't see their beauty. She was a really odd combination of progressive in some ways. She wanted the women to have the college education she never could uh, complete because she couldn't uh, pay for it. She started college but never finished. But then she was also reactionary, very much focused on men and marriage and quite racist. So the scholarship set it apart from other, other um, pageants and Bess Meyerson shown here was the first to win a scholarship in 1945. She's the only Jewish winner ever. And um, that was a, a triumph for the pageant in terms of greater inclusion. But she discovered when she went touring in the South during her reign year that she was not welcome as a Jew and she had trouble getting appearance dates. At one point she was about to actually give a talk in a country club and overheard the host saying about the club, we don't have Negroes and we don't have Jews. And Meyerson turned on her heel, packed her suitcase, got on a train, went home and became an activist speaker, sort of um, foretelling the social issues platforms that would be incorporated into the pageant in the 1990s. Um, against anti-Semitism. She became a TV personality and later a New York City political figure and consumer advocate. And for those of us who were in New York in the 80s, uh, she was also, you may remember, she was at the center of a notorious scandal, too complicated to recite here, um, but she went down with a very reputation in the end. However, she, she's still one of the best known Miss Americas and she was extremely talented as a musician and, and an intellect as well. She was a Hunter College student. She was very smart and studious and submitted a photo of herself, I love this photo, in a cap and gown for the pageant program. Uh, so that's I've, the only example of that I've seen in combing through all the programs. Don't ask me to explain what Miss Birmingham on the upper left is signifying in that photo. Uh, these random headdresses popped up on the contestants a few times inexplicably uh, over the years. So that was uh, 1945. The 40s and 50s delivered some of the most substantial and fascinating Miss Americas as Slaughter tried to imbue it with substance. <clears throat> and the only problem was that sometimes substance brought subversion. And this is one of the most rebellious winners ever. And one of the most beloved people who read the book just can't get enough of Yolande Bette Bees, who's shown here, Miss Alabama 1950. She refused to appear in a swimsuit after her crowning, saying, I'm an opera singer, not a pinup. She was a, um, a winner who, whose singing was so popular that she was asked to do two encores, which was unheard of. Um, but so the next day when she said, sorry, I'm not gonna wear the swimsuit, it turned out, uh, it, and when I say not wear the swimsuit, she wore it to compete, but she uh, announced that she would not wear it, you know, standing around in department stores as Miss America during her reign year. And conveniently, she had not signed the contract that would make her do this. Uh, this refusal changed the entire landscape of pageantry in this country because Catalina Swimwear, which was a sponsor, the owner was absolutely furious, withdrew his sponsorship and started Miss Universe um, along with its own feeder pageants, Miss USA and Miss Teen USA, all of which now run parallel to Miss America and which Donald Trump owned from 1996 to 2015. So well, in doing my research, the single biggest misconception about Miss America was, or is, I think still, that Donald Trump owned it or had something to do with it. He judged a couple, a year or two, but he, he never owned Miss America. Uh, so Beth Bees, I'm showing you here at a, a civil rights protest in 1960, she actually turned her back on the pageant in the 60s because of its racism and in the 70s because of its sexism. She objected to the dominance of white Christian winners. 
Um, to this day, all but two Miss Americas have been Christian. And she uh, returned later in the 80s after Vanessa Williams <clears throat> one, who we'll meet in a minute. Uh, she re returned and embraced it in the end and after she deemed it to be more inclusive and actually said she had been happy to be Miss America and was proud of it on her return. She lived this impossibly glamorous life. She knew everybody. She was a democratic fundraiser raiser in Washington, DC. And she was very funny, which made her fun to write about. She had to come back for everything. Um, she was told that if she signed a film contract, which she wasn't especially interested in doing, though she got offers, that she could be the new Rita Hayworth. And to that, she said, I think I'll just stay the same old Yolan Bet Bees. She was also the uh, source for Philip Roth's American Pastoral, uh, for Dawn in American Pastoral, who was a former Miss New Jersey, although the character is very much not like Yolan Bet Bees. <clears throat> she simply gave him the material to write the character. So when she went back in 1952 to crown her successor, uh, the parade marshal that year was Marilyn Monroe, which was a really odd choice considering she was emerging as a great American beauty who you would think the sponsors might imagine she would overshadow the contestants. She was in Atlantic City for the premiere of Monkey Business. Her publicist claimed she quote, murdered those poor little Miss Americas, but Monroe said that she was intimidated by them. They were intimidated by her, and for that reason, nobody spoke to her. They were just afraid. Um, but Bet Betbees approached her, struck up a conversation, and Marilyn Monroe said, put her at ease, and the two remained <clears throat> friends for life. She shocked everyone by wearing this incredibly low cut. Uh, dress that, you know, the neckline plunging to the waist, as you can see. And uh, apparently it flapped open here and there as well. The next year, a photo from this parade appeared on the debut issue of <clears throat> Playboy with her centerfold inside. So the 40s and 50s uh, produced these really interesting, complex Miss Americas and also ushered in um, this very glamorous period. The, what was sort of considered the, uh, the 50s and 60s is considered the golden era of Miss America with elaborate ceremonies, giant gowns, like what you see here, the spectacular beaded gown, uh, big stage productions. It looked a lot like a debutante ball and in some ways it was fulfilling that function. You know, middle-class women were entering it to uh, enter society and, um, uh, have a, a, an opportunity for social mo and ec economic mobility. Uh, celebrity judges became a staple. And uh, at some point, the symbolism shifted into uh, fairy tale motifs and specifically Cinderella, which you know had a certain logic to it. You went out there, you competed, you were crowned, and then the next day overnight, you were famous. So uh, the often, the, you know, this was referred to as the Cinderella moment or the Cinderella ritual at the pageant itself. And then there's a change in the 50s with the um, first TV broadcast in 1954. And that's when the pageant became a national event with many millions of viewers. It was really like a proto-American reality show, uh, reality competition in which the contestants were picked off until a winner was named. And uh, uh, appropriately that year's winner, Lee Merriweather became a successful TV actress. There was also a lot of sponsorship with products like this. This was the Miss America console TV, um, Vanessa Williams, lots actually a number of Miss Americas appeared on cereal boxes. Historically, they sold cigars and all sorts of domestic products as well. Uh, the following year, Burt Parks came on board as the host who was identified with the pageant for decades. He was known informally as Mr. Miss America. And he's the one who sang There She Is to all the winners at the end and said, um, Miss America, go down and meet your subjects. And then he would croon the song. He was like a paternal figure giving away the bride at this debutante type ritual. But 
the ritual at that point by 1968 um, was not really in step with the women's movement <clears throat> that was getting going during the 60s. So in 68, um, feminists who were fed up with um, Miss America's reactionary nature staged a protest that was really historically significant. Women came by bus from as far away as Iowa to protest the objectification of women at the pageant as well as its racism. Um, as this flyer notes, it's uh, really interesting to see sort of, you know, the hand, the hand lettering, the charter buses getting together to go. Um, you know, do they have the phone number? Uh, bring masks, in interestingly. I'm not sure what masks uh, refers to there. And so this was the protest. Um, this is where the slur bra burners originates, but no bras were actually burned. The protesters threw items symbolizing women's oppression, including bras. Um, you could see a high heel there. I think some nylons in that woman's hand all into a trash can intending to burn them, but they didn't because they couldn't get a permit. And Gloria Steinem later, she wasn't there, but she later said in talking about it, it just shows we've been way too law abiding. <clears throat> Gloria Steinem, Steinem incidentally competed in a beauty pageant when she was a teenager and um, stood on a beer keg in a bathing suit. Uh, again, an, an explanation of why women competed. It was, as she said, a way out of, of a pretty uh, low economic town that she didn't have a lot of opportunity in. So this action played a big role in publicizing second wave feminism inside as the outgoing queen made her farewell speech. Protesters dropped a bed sheet from the balcony demanding women's liberation. And so those words were on the bed sheet and because the protest was so widely re reported, the word women's liberation entered the American vernacular that week. On the very same night uh, of the feminist protests, another kind of protest happened. This was the first Miss Black America contest, which was launched in direct response to the NAACP's pressure on Miss America to integrate. The first winner was Sandra Williams. She was a, a 19 year old Philadelphia college student who wore her hair short and natural and performed an African dance wearing a yellow jumpsuit and bells on her ankles. And this contest continues today. Uh, one of its most famous contestants was uh, uh, Oprah Winfrey who won as Miss Tennessee in 1971. So in the late sixties, finally some black contestants start to uh, compete at the lower levels of the of the pageant. Uh, so, just to explain how it works, the the you know there's the national Miss America, the state winners who compete at national, and then below the state winners, all sorts of local contests that feed in to the state competition. In 1970, the first black state winner, Cheryl Brown, uh, won. She was a college student from Iowa who was actually a New Yorker from Queens. And in 1971, a member of the Muscogee Creek tribe in Oklahoma, in, uh, uh, Oklahoma sorry, won her state title, Susan Supernaw. She competed with just two other women of color that year and reported in her memoir that she was treated like a cute oddity. Uh, she realized she didn't stand a chance of winning as uh, you know, America's girl next door when nobody lived next door to a Native American that competed at, at Miss America. She's shown here wearing her buckskin regalia, which she wore for Native American appearances in Oklahoma as a state title holder, um, where she was beloved and, um, and a symbol of great pride in her state. Finally, in 1983, Miss uh, Vanessa Williams is crowned the first black Miss America. And so she's also the best known Miss America. She's a Grammy and an Emmy nominee. You may know her from Ugly Betty, um, Wilhelmina on Ugly Betty. You may know her from her music or for, from her stage work. Um, she was at the center of the, the contest's biggest scandal 
She's the only winner to be dethroned. Um, that was because nude pictures of her were published against her will by Penthouse. Penthouse made $24 million from her photos, none of which she got. And afterwards, as she wrote in her memoir, the pageant dumped her back on her parents' doorstep. And that was the end of it. But she is a great success story. She's a, a winner who succeeded in spite of, not because of Miss America. And her win um, attracted so much attention, but like from the 70s on, ratings and viewership were starting to uh, decrease. And attention was drawn back to the Miss America pageant because of Williams. So, uh, and also she, for many reasons, not the scandal, but also because her win was so significant um, for so many black girls and women who didn't even otherwise watch beauty contests. Shirley Chisholm, first American Cong black American Congresswoman applauded her win. The writer Roxane Gay said, it gave girls like me ideas that moment made us believe we too could be beautiful. And um, here's a photo a friend shared of, with me, um, my friend Lise, of a visit she made to the uh, a mall in New Jersey. And so my friend as a black teenager shared this feeling of just empowerment and excitement at um, Vanessa Williams' win. But otherwise there was very little diversity in the winners for a good stretch. Um, since, well, actually, since then, there have been eight Black Miss Americas, but otherwise not a lot of diversity. The first um, Asian American winner, Angela Perez Baracchio, was crowned in 2001, um, but there's never been a winner of Hispanic descent. There's never been a Muslim winner. There's never been another Jewish winner. This is Nina Devaluri, who um, I include here to, to show how when the pageant does uh, show inclusivity and make progress in this sense. Uh, it could serve a as a reflection of American racial intolerance. Um, she was crowned in 2014. The she was the first winner of South Asian heritage, um, Nina Davaluri. And when she was crowned, she was called a foreigner and a Muslim terrorist. She's the American born daughter of Hindu Indian immigrants. Um, women of color for years had been excluded as exemplars of real American beauty. And now her very citizenship was challenged just as Barack Obama's had been a few years earlier when he became the first black president. So in some ways, the, the pageant serves as a really revealing gauge of American perceptions of race and inclusivity. So um, what, I'm going to just wrap up in a sec, but I want to I want to ask, sort of rhetorically, what did the pageant achieve by or reflect by crowning what was called America's most beautiful bathing girl? On one level, it really did give women, some women, opportunities in a world of scarce professional possibility. Uh, here you see Deirdre Downs Deirdre Downs Gun, um, a twenty thousand a two thousand five winner. Uh, she's a doctor. She was raised by a single mom and the scholarship paid for her education. She's not only the first doctor um, who was a Miss America, but also having come out since, she, since her win, uh, she's the first to marry a woman. And so she's, you know, among many women who benefited from the scholarship and were able to get to college and get through college or graduate from college, you know, without being in extreme debt. But the pageant also has excluded many women, starting with women who aren't pretty, uh, and also because contestants can, uh, can't be married or have children, carrying on this kind of debutante tradition, it excludes people who are demographically more in need of scholarships than anyone, which is young mothers. Students who are parents, um, and a lot of them are in my classrooms as a professor, are 10 times less likely to com complete a bachelor's degree within five years than students who are not. And so they need that money to help them get through. Here you see the last winner to be crowned in a swimsuit. The swimsuit was retired in 2019. Um, and uh, Miss America was also, so Nia Franklin is being crowned. She's the one who, the, the last uh, 
one to compete in Atlantic City because the uh, casino, uh, I forget what it's called, the casino fund that subsidized Miss America uh, decided not to do that anymore. And so last, uh, the last pageant was in a casino in Connecticut in December, uh, sort of going against everything, all the, all the sort of glamour that Miss America had had as a beachside competition. So the, uh, so sorry, Nia Franklin's being crowned by Cara, Cara Mund. And, um, it, you, you know, it was a huge deal that the, that the swimsuit was removed. There was a lot of controversy about this. It caused a rift in the pageant. Um, people are in disagreement about it today. I'm interested to see though, that it seems like the vast majority of women who won really hated having to perform and having to show up in a swimsuit in, in public on that stage. So with that gone, the, the pageant hardly resembles what it you know, was in the 20s. The swimsuit's gone, the evening gowns are no longer required. It's billed as a competition for the job of Miss America. It's called a job, not as a beauty contest uh, in an effort to evolve. But as I said, the position, the participation has declined uh, considerably since the 1980s, as has the TV audience. It's dropped from about 4 million viewers uh, down from 70 million in the 1980s, uh, or actually, 60s, 70s, it was up there. So it survived mutineers and rebels like Yolan Bet Bees, World War II, feminist protests, um, and this huge rift that resulted from the decision to scrap the swimsuit uh, in actually it was 2018, I think. And so it's anyone's guess whether it will make it to its 100th birthday celebration this year. Normally the pageant is in September, a date has not been yet announced for whether it will happen. And still up in the air, what will signify, uh, what it will signify if it does, how it, how it will further evolve or if it will stay with uh, the innovations that were, the changes that were made at the last pageant. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm going to take your questions and, uh, Feel free, let's see. Yes, um, uh, there's a comment in the chat inviting you to ask questions if you have them. And I think, um, I'm not sure if, I think people can ask questions like unmic themselves and ask or put them in the chat. Oh, actually I see a- I have one from Amy. She's asking um, what funds the Miss America empire? enterprise rather. Oh, what funds it? You know, that's a that's a really interesting question because one of the things that I was surprised to discover was that the scholarships are funded basically by the women themselves. In other words, you have to raise a thousand dollars. It's tiered whether you're competing at the national or the state or the local level, but for national winners, you have to uh, raise and by that, you know, get money from people you know um, to pr participate, to compete. And so uh, their lawyer who I interviewed, you know, just trying to understand it institutionally, told me that that funds 85% of their scholarships. It is a nonprofit, but um, it's one of the contradictions of Miss America that the women themselves are funding it. Another contradiction in terms of the scholarships is that the focus is on education and scholarships, and yet once women win, they have to drop out of college for a year to serve during their year as Miss America. Any other questions? I hope I fully answered Amy's question. I'm not seeing any yet, but I have one. Okay, go ahead. Um, what are you working on next? Oh, that's a terrible question. <laughs> oh, that, that, my agent asked me that too. And, and I should have an answer, but I don't. I mean, uh, there's, there's a, actually a character who's really interesting in the story who I'd love to write about. So Laurie Fox, consider this something I forgot to tell you in our last conversation. She was the woman who um, 
when the swimsuit was evolving, um, she was an Olympic swimmer who designed, um, Annette Kellerman is her name, she designed a form-fitting swimsuit and was arrested on the beach in, I think it was 1907, for wearing this suit. But the whole idea was it was easy to swim, swim in, it hugged the body. She was also um, a performer. She was in films. She was one of the first women to appear naked in a film. Um, I think her hair was very strategically placed. I think she was playing a mermaid in the film actually. And um, so she was a fascinating figure, someone who was both um, a, a major sports figure as a swimmer and a fashion innovator because she designed the swimsuit uh, and a film star. So. I've been thinking about her a lot lately, but I can't say I uh, will write something about her or not. I have to, I have to, I have to ponder that a little longer. Um, oh, someone's saying there's a, a children's book about Annette Kellerman called Mermaid Queen. Thank you, Erica. I have to check that out. I think there may have been a biography written of her, written about her a while back, but um, from what I scoped out there's more to say okay other questions anybody want got about four of them so far um eric is asking was there a competition last year live or on zoom wondering how they would accomplish that um yeah there was a um i'm getting my years mixed up but so there was the last year that it was in atlantic city which i guess was 2018 then in 2019 it was in uh in the casino in Connecticut, um, but then there was no pageant last year. Um, so, sorry, now I'm forgetting the question. Um, oh, if they had it um, during the pandemic last year. Yeah, so there was no pageant. And then the, the other issue is that now state pageants are starting up and there's um, questions about whether these should be happening in person. Um, and I, I do remember a controversy about one that was in person and a, a contestant was expected to appear on stage without a mask and <clears throat> she didn't want to do that. And I forget how that unfolded, but it's tricky. I, I am interested to see though that all the, all the contests are getting organized now. There's a whole schedule of the, of the state competitions happening. And I'm just not sure what percentage is in person and what percentage are Zoom contests. There have been Zoom contests during this pandemic. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Erica, did Larry? Um, Larry's asking, what, what do you think will be the future of Miss America? You know, that's a good question. It's really hard to say. Like sometimes people will say, do you think it will survive beyond the 100th anniversary? And, and the, the question would be in what way? Like as a, or, or sometimes people ask, do you think it should survive? You know, the scholarship portion of it is important and valuable. Um, the, but then like the fact that it's attached to all these other things and coming out of the swimsuit history and the requirement that you have to be single and you can't have children um, doesn't really jibe with the scholarship. So I don't, I guess in answer to the question, if it, survives, will it be a scholarship program? Will it go back to being something more like what it was? I know some people really want the, the gown and the swimsuit back and to them, that's what Miss America was. And now with um, the changed format, which also interestingly includes uh, just recently, it, it was determined that people don't have to perform in an entertainment sense. One of the historic contradictions was People who wanted to, you know, get a scholarship to study biology um, still had to get out and do a song and dance or some kind of a performance, which didn't relate at all to what their professional aspirations were. So I'm not sure if it will sur survive. It's not really looking good. And if it survives, there's going to have to be a lot of work done on what it will be. Thank you. Um, Amy's asking, do they do any charitable work? Yes, and that's, um, I didn't really emphasize this in my talk, but in 1990, the social issues platform requirement 
was added. And so that required people to embrace a cause, literacy or breast cancer or bullying or um, you know, any number of many hundreds of causes. And so the, the state winners uh, adopt a cause and support that cause, it could be child abuse, could be sexual abuse. Uh, and so that's uh, really integral to the identity of Miss America. There's you know, great pride in the, the, those causes. And uh, there's a woman actually, I, I consider her one of the really most interesting Miss Americas, Marilyn Vanderburg, her, Vanderburg who uh, won in the late 50s and had been sexually abused by her dad uh, growing up and became an activist um, for, for victims of incest. She's now in her 80s, she's still doing this and it's really important work. And uh, she has said she could never have done this and had the platform and the profile to do it if she had not been Miss America. And that's, that's sort of how um, it's, it has been important historically for reasons like that, to give women who have a good cause a platform to promote that cause. That makes sense. I never, I you don't really, I feel like I don't look at it that way, but I, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, there's, again, it, it, through the years, it's conflicted with the other requirements like the swimsuit. If you want to have that cause, why should you have to wear a swimsuit? And the other question with the um, scholarship too is why must women compete with each other for these scholarships? Like going back to women competing in the early years of the pageant, um, you know, just after women's suffrage, um, they're, you know, they're competing against each other exactly at a time when women have been empowered to enter the world of men. So it does sort of perplex me that the scholarship competition is gender. That doesn't seem necessary to me. Sure. <laughs> Um, Marcia's asking, I came in late, but how, how did you get interested in researching Miss America? Good question. I got interested because um, my other books are about women's history. My first book was a feminist history of tattoo art going back to the 19th, late 19th century. And uh, then my second book spun out of that. It's a biography of a, uh, w one of the very earliest <clears throat> tattooed women in this country, Olive Oatman. Um, who was raised by Mojave Indians in California and tattooed on her face. And so uh, she was a very interesting uh, example of a, woman, of a pioneer who became bicultural because her family was initially, take, or she was initially taken captive um, by one tribe and then traded to another who adopted her and raised her as their own. So both in my books and in most of my journalistic writing, I've been writing about women's history, uh, sometimes through the lens of pop culture. And that's a, a lot of what I teach as well as a journalism and English professor. Thanks. Sure. Um, Nora's asking about um, Jane Mercer, Miss Arizona from 89. Um, um, Miss Arizona from 89, I don't think I know her, but was there anything specific? There was Jackie Mercer, um, who was a Miss America, but I think that's not who she means. I, let me look at the chat, so I'm seeing the name. Okay, sure. Jay Mercer, Miss America, Miss Arizona 89. Um, flamed out from Nora. I, I, I'm, I'd love to hear this, uh, but I don't, I'm not placing this person. Nora, if you want to talk um, live, let me know. I know, unmute you. And then the last question is from Gabrielle. She's, um, they're asking the financial cost to participate in the competition. Oh yes, that is a very good question because it can be really expensive. When I was doing, I mean, well, some people will say it doesn't have to be expensive. And there have been women who competed in borrowed gowns or um, you know, retailered wedding gowns or prom gowns. Uh, but when I was doing research, I think it was a Miss Rhode Island was, uh, had a GoFundMe and she was trying to raise money to get to Miss Rhode Island. And uh, 
her GoFundMe said that it could cost $10,000 for her to do all this. That's the other paradox of it, that women are competing to get money, but they're spending a lot of money. And in fact, one of the uh, first, uh, in, in one of the first beauty, maybe the first beauty contest in this country in Rehoboth Beach, uh, sort of set this pattern of a woman was crowned and won and paid to get there and bought an expensive gown to compete, but then couldn't afford to get home and had to sell her gown to get back home. So that sort of encapsulates the, the challenge of you know, pay, paying to try to make money and it's not guaranteed. But now in, in um, many contestants defense, a, a lot of them will say they don't care if they won. Like there, in fact, some people don't want to win Miss America because of all the um, obligations that come with it. Some prefer to win the state title and get it varies, the money that they win varies around the country. But if you can get, um, for example, in one state, I forget if it's North Carolina, $70,000 to win your state title, you're, you're in good shape. And so maybe you, you want to stick with that. You, you may not want to win because you can get that money and not have to travel as Miss America for a year. You're only traveling in your state. Maybe not have to drop out of college. And uh, so, you know, there's, there, there is this paradox of, of paying to compete, but sorry, I lost my previous thought, which was simply that for many women, it's not necessarily about the money. It's about training, you know, professional training uh, to be a public figure, public speaking, um, the, the platform, which can lead to other kinds of professional work. So there are values there to some of the people who can compete um, that make it worth it. Thank you. Um, Amy has another question. She's asking, what's the age range that the contestants can be? I think it's 17 to 26. So it's younger than you would have thought. You'd sort of assume, you know, 18, but um, it's, and I think it's varied a little bit over the years, but the last I checked, it was 17 to 26. And the other strange thing about Miss America is that it's Miss America, the women are being trained for, um, you know, to be professionals. And yet the, the honorific Miss has not been used in the professional world for decades. The problem is that there is a Miss America contest for older women, like 26 or 20 and up. So Miss America can't rename itself Ms. America to get with the times because that name is taken. Thanks. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, was there anything that surprised you while you were writing it that you didn't expect to find out or? I, you know, a lot of the stories were um, surprising to me, both, you know, women who regretted it or women who loved it, you know, for exactly the same reason. Um, there's one aspect of the story that I wish I could have really explored more, which was Miss America's uh, significance for gay men. I only really touched on that briefly at one section in the book, but then after writing the book, uh, a couple of people approached me saying, explaining how much it had meant to them, you know, the, this sort of performance of gender was meaningful to them. One friend from high school wrote me about like his real um, involvement and just the great pleasure he took in Miss America and following the contestants and their fashion and, and their self-presentation, the, the whole drama of it. So um, I would have liked to be able to explore that further. Thanks. Sure. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. Okay, well, that's good. I, I want to thank everybody for coming. It's actually perfectly timed. We're right at eight o'clock. Um, thank you, Tracy. Thanks, everybody. I really wish I could see you. And uh, now that I hear the library may be back in action in a few months, who knows, we may all see each other. But I appreciate everybody coming. And uh, it was great fun. Thank you for being here. This was great. Thank you. Have a good All right. Thanks. Okay. okay. See everyone later.